This episode of New Politics was released on the 23rd of July, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, the ghost of a former Prime Minister appears. This time it's a miserable ghost. The environment is finally on the centre stage of politics, but how long will it stay there? And the start of the 47th Parliament. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, Suzanne Lay's Environment Policy Advisor. And a big thank you to our new Patreon subscribers. Thanks for signing up. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. It's just $5 per month for the Ruby Standard Supporter level or $10 per month for the Gold Standard Supporter level. But whether it's a subscription or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. After a quiet period since the election loss on May the 21st, the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison has resurfaced. First of all, he spoke in South Korea at the Asian Leadership Conference, and that's a forum organised by the Conservative newspaper, Chosen Ilbo. And that would be a little bit like a forum presented by the Australian newspaper or News Corporation in Australia. And at this forum, he accused China of supporting Russian war crimes by purchasing wheat from Russia. And he also went on to blame the states and COVID-19 for causing the coalition's loss at the federal election. And maybe it wasn't such a big deal for him to lose the election because a few days later, he also said this. We don't trust in governments. We don't trust in the United Nations, thank goodness. We don't trust in all of these things, fine as they might be and, and as important as the role that they play. But as someone who's been in it, If you are putting your faith in those things, like I put my faith in the Lord, you are making a mistake. And he said that at the launch of the new building for the Victoria Life Pentecostal Church in Perth. And that's a five-storey prayer tower. And we don't know how much it costs to build, but we do know that the Victory Life Church received $500,000 through JobKeeper support and assorted federal government grants of $650,000 over the past two financial years. But aside from this, at the forum, Morrison spoke about anxiety in society and how somehow this is all Satan's plan. He railed against identity politics and sexuality in society. And again, he talked about believing in miracles, which didn't seem to help him very much at the 2022 federal election. Now, the progress of time gives us all a little bit of space to reflect upon what we witness in public life. But As time goes on, and all of this is in hindsight, of course, Scott Morrison's time as Prime Minister becomes more and more bizarre and more and more unbelievable as time goes on. In a couple of generations' time, when the histories of this period are being written, he's going to be seen as some kind of bizarre anomaly, and and it'll be the question of what were we thinking And I think his dogged determination to become Prime Minister was a big part of it. And I have to say, too, that I don't fully disagree with him when he says that it was the states and COVID that caused him to lose the election. It was his mismanagement of COVID that caused him to lose the election in in large part. There's a whole other range of reasons, too. But certainly COVID didn't bring down a lot of governments that handled COVID well with the possible exception of the South Australian Liberal Party. But even then, there were factors around that that suggested that they probably would have lost that election under a non-pandemic conditions. So the fact too, I don't know if you saw this, Eddie, but the fact that he started the whole conspiracy thing on the United Nations and we don't trust in governments and we don't trust in the United Nations, which of course includes things like the World Health Organization, favourite bugbear of conspiracy theorists. And conservatives, and the two aren't necessarily the same, let's be fair. There is a bit of crossover. He then goes on to undermine what he says by saying, oh, these are really important and they're really worthy, but we don't trust them. Well, it's one or the other. So it's like his lived experience and 
his philosophical beliefs are in conflict, I think. Well, of course, people are free to engage in their religion of choice and we shouldn't criticise those things that we don't understand. But Morrison's speech at the Victory Life Church, it was paranoid, engaging in an us versus them mentality. And to be honest, it was actually quite sad, bizarre and nonsensical really and this follows on from other conservative politicians in recent years we had former deputy prime minister barnaby joyce saying that he just wants to get the government out of his face morrison now saying that he doesn't have trust in governments or the united nations and this is all QAnon, new world order conspiracy claptrap pretty much we've pointed out this relationship between scott morrison and QAnon fringe groups on new politics in the past the mainstream media refused to analyze this relationship and critique it adequately to the public and this is really a fundamentalist and troubling philosophy that guided morrison's behavior as prime minister and he spruiked this and tried to translate his religious beliefs into government and and i think this was all thoroughly rejected by the electorate at the last election part of i believe the pentecostal movement is a distrust of earthly governments and you put your full faith in God. And again, I'm not here to say that's absolutely wrong and people shouldn't do that. People should believe what they like. But when it clashes with your clear experience, it's time for some hard thinking to go on, I I should think. Well, on New Politics a few months ago, we suggested that Scott Morrison was arguably Australia's worst Prime Minister at a time when we needed to have the best Prime Minister available to us. But I would also add that he was potentially the most dangerous Prime Minister in that all of these like-minded people were in Parliament, Pentecostals and evangelist Christians, and that's people like Alex Hawke, Andrew Hastie, Stuart Robert, Gladys Liu, Amanda Stoker, and it seemed like they just had no interest in government at all. I mentioned before, Barnaby Joyce wanted to get government out of his life. Morrison's saying that he doesn't have trust in government, yet they were all a part of government and did their best to run it down. And I think it's becoming more apparent as time goes by that they actually did very little while they were in government. Morrison is someone who actually was the Prime Minister up until May the 21st, but he's coming across more like a TV evangelist. And for sure, if he wants to do that, there's no problem about that. But we have to remember that he's still a member of Parliament. He's representing the people in the seat of Cook. And I think it's becoming more obvious that the electorate is tolerant generally of an MP's personal religious beliefs, but they just don't want that crossover into politics. And I think the last election result supports this idea. But the Liberal Party needs to be careful about the type of people that they select to run in elections in the future, because that was so thoroughly rejected just a few months ago. And if they continue to support these kinds of people, they'll be out of office for a very, very long time. That's exactly right. It's a movement that, as I said earlier, doesn't trust government at all. And that's fine. You're allowed to have those opinions. And let's be fair, some governments aren't worth trusting. (laughs) Maybe not the ones they would say, but nonetheless, it's as if the, I'll call it a demotion from prime minister to backbencher, means that he's not interested in the job of representing the people of Cook. Now, whether he goes and gets his qualification to be a preacher or whether, I'm not sure you need a a qualification in, in the Pentecostal movement to be a preacher, and he goes and does that, may be his plan, but you can't really be both, I don't think, unless he's just Sunday morning, takes a couple of hours off. But Sunday mornings are generally devoted to party business, local branch meetings, barbecues, social gatherings. And everyone said it at the time, if he doesn't win, he'll step down and cause a by-election. Some people get really angry at that. I can see that once you've been prime minister, the appeal of backbencher work may not be everybody's cup of tea. And that's okay. Some prime ministers, of course, stayed on and served loyally for years after being prime minister. Others quietly just drifted away and were able to wait till the next election and then step down then and others just got out as soon as they can. Uh, I know by-elections are expensive, but you want the very best members of parliament. And this takes us back to your point that if they keep pre-selecting people who aren't at least in broad agreement with their constituency, they're going to keep losing. And of course, that whole court case, which we keep coming back to, was over should the Liberal Party have uh, a more membership-based pre-selection 
process or should they be allowed to pre-select whomever they want from a small committee of people? Well, that's the essence of being a party member. Like, If you haven't got a say in who gets pre-selected in your own electorate, there's virtually no point in being a member of any political party, quite frankly. But I guess the other point is how much should we listen to former prime ministers? And as I mentioned before, Scott Morrison has been quiet for several months after his election loss, and he's recently reappeared in the public square. And I guess it's all going to get down to what we actually think of those prime ministers and what we think that they can offer to public debate and public discourse. And prime ministers are national leaders, and they end up getting to that position for a reason. So, of course, there'll be a public interest in whatever they have to say or whatever they do. Gough Whitlam, Paul Keating, Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard, Malcolm Fraser, they all continue to have a strong public presence and valuable contribution to public discourse. And Malcolm Turnbull, he's still got a strong public presence at the moment. Tony Abbott and John Howard, even though I'm repulsed by their brand of politics, they still had a contribution to make to conservative politics after they left Parliament. But to me, Scott Morrison just doesn't seem to have any redeeming features. And it's like a growing morass of public paranoia. It's fringe fundamentalist religious beliefs. And I think the only benefit for having Scott Morrison in public life is as a reminder for what a bad Prime Minister looks like and the type of leadership that we should avoid in the future. But he was just re-elected as the member for Cook, so it seems like he might be around for some time to come. And as a former Prime Minister, we'll just have to keep listening to him for some time to come as well. It'll be interesting to see how much he keeps the interest of the, the press Probably more than any other Prime Minister, he was a a puppet of the Murdoch in particular, but certainly the right-wing press. Once he lost the election, he got 100% of the blame in a way that a lot of other Prime Ministers didn't. It's always, of course, the Prime Minister's responsibility for winning or losing an election. That's the deal. Usually when they lose, the party analysts will point to a whole range of factors, some in the Prime Minister's control, some well outside the Prime Minister's control, because they need to know what went wrong for the next election. But the public view of this one was that it was all Scott Morrison's fault. There were leaks about his unpopularity within the party. There were leaks about how people were shocked that he was far less substantial than he'd presented before he got the job. There were leaks about the personal visceral dislike a lot of people had for him. Now, of course, a prime minister doesn't have to be everybody's friend and it's probably best in some cases that they're not everybody's friend. But generally, there's a level of like or grudging respect or or at least a sense of, well, that was the best person we could put up at the time for a whole range of reasons. It didn't work out for us, and we're going away to have a think about what went wrong and how we can do it better next time. And this is true of both parties. Probably the only other Prime Minister that comes close was Kevin Rudd, about how unpopular he was and how much of a micromanager he was and how much of this and that. Rudd had a personal standing in the community that may not have been shared by a lot of his colleagues, but Morrison didn't. Morrison is part of the reason, of course, that they lose the election. His micromanaging, his determination to have everything his way. And I also think that one of the things that Morrison didn't like was that he was Prime Minister and people just didn't do what he said, that he had to negotiate, he had to work with people. And I think that was part of his mistrust of government and mistrust of the United Nations, that the United Nations presented different evidence to the evidence he was after. I think the media will tire of him very quickly and he will be more like, say, a John Gorton who made very, very few public statements after he was Prime Minister. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au and you can now support New Politics through Patreon. The Minister for Environment, Tanya Plibersek, she's released the State of Environment report and it's quite a scathing report 
of the lack of action on climate change and on the environment over the past nine years by the Coalition Government. And this is what Tanya Plibersek referred to as the willful neglect by the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments. The report is published every five years and it's a report that the previous Environment Minister, Susan Lay, she received that in December last year but refused to release it and it's easy to see why. The report outlines how Australia has suffered catastrophic losses of wildlife and habitat over the past five years. 17 mammals have been placed on the endangered species list. There's increasing pressures from climate change, habitat loss, invasive mining. Pollution and resource extraction have degraded Australian ecosystems and a lack of resolve on climate change issues over the past decades have greatly contributed to this degradation. Tanya Plibersek has pledged new environment legislation to deal with these issues and she has warned that there are no quick fixes to all of this and there's absolutely no doubt that this is the case but it's going to take a long, long time to remedy these environmental issues that have been neglected for a long, long time. There's a sense in which you can understand why Suzanne Lay delayed it. It was never going to win an election. Now, of course, this isn't why you delay. Not really. Government does need to maintain its position and does need to win elections, but it also needs to govern. So it was actually pretty poor form, but they held it back. And I'm not sure if it was one of those booby traps they put in for the new government to have to deal with, like the trillion dollar debt, like the various human rights things that they could have dealt with and didn't. I'm wondering if they wanted to see if they could get Labor maximum blame. Some things Labor has received the blame for, even though it was a coalition fault. Some things Labor has received the the blame for because they actually deserved it. But in this case, it's pretty clear that it's a coalition issue and that nine years of inaction is hurting Australia. We're seeing England with Australian summer temperatures And for those of us freezing in Australia, we've got English winter temperatures here. We've got the hottest summer in Europe ever, but it's stretching all the way across to Russia. Germany, Spain, Italy, France, Greece are all experiencing extremely hot summers. The coalition government was at fault is something that needs to be dealt with, but it's not the priority. The priority is trying to fix the environment as quickly as we can. We can then go for Barnaby Joyce, Matt Canavan, Angus Taylor, all of these people whose personal interests were more important than the national interest. And the national interest isn't just about holding on to natural resources and defence and making sure Australia comes out on top every time. It is about looking after the populace and part of looking after the populace is a stable and safe environment. The State of the Environment report is a very important report and it's also a reminder of how little the previous government respected the environment and saw environmental issues through a political prism that anything to do with the environment is an area that relates to left of centre and progressive politics and it's almost the anathema of conservative politics. But guess what? We've only got the one planet and environmental problems and degradation affect everyone in the world. And it's not some type of process where voting for the Liberal and National Parties inoculates you from environmental problems or that having a Liberal National Government makes the problem disappear by not doing anything at all about it. And that's been the approach over the past nine years and that didn't work out very well at all. And I think willful neglect is probably the best way of putting it. And also the other factor is that the media had a good time of promoting this idea that Tanya Plibersek was demoted when she was moved from the education portfolio to environment. But we can see exactly what the federal government is doing here. Tanya Plibersek is a high profile politician. She's highly visible and highly recognisable. And the government wants the environment to be a high profile issue over the next term of parliament and it's not so much that they've got a choice about this it's pretty much what the electorate voted for and there's a lot of national and international environment and climate change issues that do need to be addressed over the next decade or two so who better to promote the environment than Tanya Plibersek and I've also heard through our sources that Plibersek actually wanted the environment portfolio, and not that it's up to her to decide, that's up to the Prime Minister and Labor Party factions as well. So all of this material and innuendo through the media that it was a demotion, well, that's that's a complete furphy. It's probably the second or third most 
important position and it's the most important portfolio, I think. Everything else, including Treasury, including Attorney General, including Foreign Affairs, has to be placed under environment. Tanya Plibersek has started off really well. She's articulate. She's genuinely concerned. And she's working as fast as she can in a system that is designed for slow to get things happening. She was talking about looking forward to speaking to all the major players. And that's public servants, that's business people, members of other parties, particularly the Greens. And There's been a lot of noise, which I suspect is coming from News Corp, about are the Greens going to block it? And we see a repeat of when they blocked the the Gillard and the Rudd reforms. And as far as I can tell, if you look under the noise, everyone who counts is prepared to talk. So hopefully we will get that bare minimum of 43% in the very near future, which then increases. That's going to be a challenge for any minister but I get the sense that Plibersek will be able to do it. Well, I think it's obvious that the federal government is pushing forward environment and climate change as a whole of economy situation and trying to embed these issues throughout all of society. And it's not just a process of saving trees and marsupials, which is what the previous environment minister, Susan Lay, was on about, even though she didn't do that part pretty well. And she did close to nothing within that portfolio and seemed to be on a permanent holiday. And maybe that's why the media thought that it was a demotion for Tanya Plibersek when she actually got the environment portfolio. But I think generally we have to change our attitudes about what the environment portfolio was all about. And it's got the potential, as you mentioned before, David, it's got that potential to be one of the most powerful and all-encompassing ministries within government. And if the federal government can make that link of improving the environment and mitigating climate change issues and a clear relationship with the economy and all parts of the community, I think that they will be on a political winner. But I think that the problem is, how do they actually get to that point? The Environment Minister will need to make those approvals on those coal developments and greenfield mines that you mentioned before, David, during the next term of Parliament. And I think it's going to be quite difficult to promote your environmental credentials on one hand and then on the other hand have all these new coal mines running in the background. And I don't think that's going to wash with... The public and it's probably going to make life a little bit more difficult in parliament the independent mp zali stegel she's already mentioned that she wants any new environmental legislation to become dutton proof so it can't just be repealed if there's a change of government which what happened before with the carbon pricing mechanism in 2014 when that was repealed by the Abbott government. So there's still a lot of work that has to be done on cleaning up the environment and addressing climate change. It looks like it's going to be a hard and long road ahead to achieve anything meaningful. It's not going to be easy. And we have to be grateful, and here come the one-star reviews, that we have a capable government. Now, I would absolutely say this if the Liberal Party had been capable. It has been derailed and we had very, very poor ministry. Even its best performers wouldn't have made an early Howard cabinet or a Fraser cabinet, let alone if they'd been Labour, a Hawke, Keating, Rudd or Gillard cabinet. They were its best performers. We have to be grateful that we do have a cabinet that is filled with competent and intelligent people who at this point seem to want the best for the country, even if you don't agree with it. And this, of course, is all I've ever asked for from my government. (laughs) But bring on those one-star reviews about how biased we are. Well, I guess we should be talking about the new federal government rather than bagging the old one that was there for nine years. But I think one I think one other critical point, and this goes to the heart of how governments operate, this state of environment report that was actually received by the minister in December last year and she sat on the report and did nothing with it before the election it just sat in her office collecting dust and the previous government had this habit of sitting on critical reports there was the sexual harassment in parliament house report that was embargoed for well over a year the banking report was embargoed for a long time aged care report embargoed for almost a year as well And there were those reports that were meant to be released by the former secretary to the Prime Minister, Philip Gaitchens, and these just 
disappeared into a black hole and were never seen of again. And I do understand that it takes time for governments to accept reports and consider their responses, but I can guarantee you that the State of Environment report would have never been released if the Coalition had won the last election. And ministers actually do have that right to do that if that's what they want to do. But is it time to place a time limit on the release of these reports? You know, for example, government receives a report and then releases it within a month because sitting on a report for 12 or 18 months is totally unacceptable. And this is a process that does need to change with the new government. Yeah, I mean, there'll always be ways around it. Reports can take longer to write than expected. The latest one is national security, it seems. We look at Barnaby Joyce's text messages for his water envoy position. We look at the process for John Barillaro in uh, New South Wales, both of which were denied freedom of information through national security. And of course, in some of these reports, national security is an issue, but it ruins your credibility when you try and hide behind this stuff all the time. Again, I think Tanya Plibersek has to be commended for being not only so honest about the report, because that just damages the last government and that any politician would do that, but for taking seriously, at least in this early stage, the job that she's got to do. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be really difficult. And I'd say this if it was Suzanne Lay doing this, by the way. It's going to need a lot of support she may not make it through to the end. It may be too arduous. It may be too much for one person to be able to do. And the job may get split. I don't know. She may fix it all in six months in the way that Penny Wong was able to repair our South Pacific foreign relations. I think it'll be much more difficult than that because there are a lot of vested interests who are happy with the status quo. So I guess all we can do is look at the job she's doing If it needs criticism, criticise it, but let it get on with it and see how it pans out. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. There is nothing fair in this world. safe in this world And there is nothing sure in this world And there is nothing pure in this world Look for something left in this world It's a nice day for a white wedding It's a Stay to start again. It's a nice day for a white wedding. And the 47th Parliament commences next week in Canberra and it's all going to look very, very different. Labor and the Coalition are going to swap sides in the House of Representatives and the Senate. There'll be quite a few new faces and this parliament is going to be more representative of Australia than any parliament in history. It's got the highest representation of women ever, 38% in the House of Representatives and 57% of the Senate. Indigenous members make up 10% of the 76 Senate seats, only 1.2% of the 151 House of Representative seats though. But There's people from a range of different cultural backgrounds, sexual preferences, religious backgrounds. It's less white. There's a whole batch of new independent MPs on the crossbench, and it feels like this could be a far more dynamic parliament than anything that we've ever seen in the past 120 years. The Albanese government, it was presented as a small target opposition by the media, and as far as I'm concerned, this is actually quite lazy media analysis. It's just that... Labor didn't provide any political ammunition for Scott Morrison to use against them like they did in the 2019 election. And if the media had bothered to look, Labor did have a comprehensive platform of ideas and policy. But I guess the point is that once you're in government, a wide range of possibilities do open up. There's the agenda on climate change, the environment, aged care, early education, there's the economy, there's wages reform, patching up international relationships, gender equity issues... 
And how a political party enters its term of office defines the way that it will behave once it actually gets into office. And how it starts off its first parliamentary session also defines and shapes its agenda. And I think this is an important point of time in the future of Australian politics and Australian society. Yeah, and I know that every election is the most important election of a generation, but that last one really was. That was our last chance to try and fix things. It may be too late. I'm optimistic that it's not, but I'm looking at, as we all are, temperatures in cold countries. We're looking at the island of Great Britain and an island buckling under heat that they're just not equipped for. We're looking at corruption being exposed. Finally, most of us looking closely could see it, but it's starting to get out into the open world. And again, we should be grateful that we have what seems to be at this stage a fairly honest government. And of course, the vested interests who don't like that are going to fight against it. Privilege will do anything to protect its privilege. Oh, well, I guess the uh, government is always going to be honest un- until it starts behaving dishonestly. Mm. But I've noticed that the federal government is still using that talking point of governing according to what they promise to the electorate in the lead up to the election. And Anthony Albanese promised to be a cautious prime minister and lead a cautious government. But this is what all opposition say during a change election. Kevin Rudd back in 2007 and all that talk about being a fiscal conservative Bob Hawke promising no change in 1983, John Howard in 1996, Tony Abbott in 2013. This is what they all say, but then work towards achieving their agenda. Tony Abbott seemed to be promising a continuation of the previous Labor government in pretty much everything that he said in opposition except for the carbon pricing mechanism. But then he implemented his hardline neoconservative politics and policies and practices once he was actually in government. And I think that Labor can do the same or take on the same approach, take on a more ambitious political agenda and play the politics of this very, very hard. And if the Liberal and National parties can do it, well, so can the Labor Party. The Prime Minister and his senior ministers, they can always use events of the day to navigate towards the agendas that they wish to implement. And they've recently been using the trillion dollar debt so we can't afford it type of argument with many programs. We can't raise unemployment benefits because of national government debt. We can't do this because of national government debt. We can't do that because of national government debt. And last week they said that they couldn't afford to restart the paid pandemic emergency leave because of national government debt. There was that excuse again before reversing that decision by the weekend. And that was a political mistake. But in politics, you find the reasons and excuses for the things that you don't want to do. Then you use the same excuses and reasons for doing the things that you do want to implement. And this is the fine art of politics. And I think it's just a matter of how they want to achieve their agenda. Yeah. And that's the challenge of all governments. What is the agenda? That's usually... Relatively easy, even though hard fought, followed by how do we do it? John Howard tried to split things into the core promises, what we really need to do, and the non-core promises, the stuff that if we don't get to it, then we'll get to it later, or perhaps it's not that important. He burnt a lot of credibility, and rightly, on that. He maybe should have talked about core policy and non-core policy. That might have been better for him. But there's a sense in which he was right often for reasons beyond the control of the government, things that you've promised or things that you've said you would do can't be done or have to be done differently or have to be delayed or have to be changed so fundamentally that there's something completely different. It's just the nature of government or Westminster government, government by committee, government by coalition, government by parties, government by trying to get enough votes and enough support. Frustrating as it is, it's as Winston Churchill was alleged to have said, the worst thing ever, but still better than everything else that's ever been tried. There's some very high expectations on the current government. In a way, there wasn't in the Morrison one. We had low expectations and they failed to meet them. Well, there are very high expectations of this new federal government. And in this term of parliament and after the poor style of government that we've had over the past nine years, and sorry for continuously bagging the previous government, but there was a lot to look at over there and we're just going to keep doing that. But 
My feeling is that all that Anthony Albanese has to do is present himself as a competent leader and allow his ministers to do what they need to do. And this is the Hawke and Howard model of a cabinet-led government rather than a prime ministerial-led government. And Albanese has said that he'll model his government on the government of Bob Hawke. And and I think if he does this, he will have electoral success. And, And of course, this is easier said than done. But If you look around, the Liberal Party is falling apart intellectually and philosophically. They're not sure what they are at the moment. They've got a leader who's got the electoral appeal of an old lamppost. He's not a very credible leader. They've also got a new deputy leader, Susan Lay, who's coming across as a total whinger. Anthony Albanese is the opposite of Scott Morrison, or that's how he's appearing so far. And Morrison was pretty much a fabricated, authentic type of leader, trying to be an everyman to everybody, but then becoming a nobody. And although I did notice Albanese getting his COVID booster last week while he was wearing an Australian rugby jumper, and if you squinted just a little bit, he did look like Scott Morrison. So why he was doing this, I've got no idea. But doing all of that phony dress-ups in Australian sport attire... That's the domain of John Howard and Scott Morrison. And I thought, well, you don't really need to do this anymore. That's all been done in the past. Why continue with this formula, which doesn't seem to work anymore? I suspect that there's always going to be an element in politics that will stick on the formula till they know it doesn't work anymore. That's not to excuse it or to say that that's how it should be. I suspect that Anthony Albanese's love of rugby league is far more entrenched than Scott Morrison's ever was. And, of course, one thing we have shown in Australia, we can have prime ministers who have no interest in sport. Paul Keating springs to mind. Bob Carr, as New South Wales Premier, thought it was time to go home at half time and was disappointed when he realised there was still another 45 minutes to go. And when they tried to make Carr a, a sports fan, it failed horribly. No one believed it. But it also showed them that nobody cared. As long as he was doing the job as Premier, people were happy with that. And he could go off and do his bushwalks and read his books and all the stuff that uh, Bob Carr liked to do. For Bob Hawke, for John Howard, These were genuine passions, cricket for Howard and I think everything for Hawke. And I think people appreciate that too. It's that authenticity that people like. It's not forced. And again, not being a sports person, I can't comment on much further than what I can see and I I can't see that much. So the early tips for the new federal government, and there's quite a few political advisors that listen to new politics, so thanks for listening in. But what they really need to do is work towards those issues that the electorate is after and the electorate voted for, the Federal Anti-Corruption Commission, climate change, reworking the national electricity grid, environmental issues, aged care, early education. And I think that if the electorate can see the direction that all of this is going in, even if it's not completed, and there's a lot of issues that can't be completed within one parliamentary term, there will be electoral rewards in the future. And and I know that I'm making it sound too easy, and it's not, it never is. But the big issue, as big as all of those other issues that I just mentioned are, the biggest issue is government finances and how all of this relates to the economy. And governments need to manage the economy well so that they can achieve their agendas. And having a large national government debt doesn't necessarily preclude you from trying to achieve your agenda. But as we've mentioned many times before on New Politics, this is a time for new economic thinking and new economic methods of addressing political, environmental and social problems and making the economy work in the interests of the community and not the other way around. And economic thinking does evolve over time. We can't use economic thinking from the 1800s to address contemporary economic concerns. And there's a great deal of economic thinking from economists such as Thomas Piketty, Joseph Stiglitz, who's been doing quite a few economic forums in Australia recently, and that's been done online, not so much in person. Jim Chalmers is untested as treasurer. He's never been in government before, so it will be interesting to see if he's willing to go down this path of economic reform to address budget issues and the national finances. But it's almost like he's got no alternative, and maybe that's what will make or break this government. How well they can harness the economy in the interests of the community and how quickly this can be achieved. Yeah, whatever the government wanted to do, it will come in after they fix the environment or not. It's a bit like the Morrison government was defined really by the the COVID pandemic. The 
Curtin government was defined by World War Two. The Hawke and Keating governments were defined by the 80s recessions. There are sometimes things that happen, change your priorities. And it's too early to know if what they're doing will work. There's a lot of stakeholders involved who don't want the change, and we've discussed this before, or who want the change in a different way to maybe how it has to be done. But this is, I think, the defining actions of the Albanese government. I was just going to say that Labor generally, when they do get into office, they're impatient and they want to implement their reforms and yeah. their agendas as soon as possible. But the dynamics of politics has already changed since the last election. And we'll find out next week whether this change of dynamics continues or whether it gets stuck in the same old quagmire that we've had over the past nine years. And I'm hoping that it doesn't for the sake of the country. But I guess that's why we're so keen to see how the next week of Parliament will pan out. I did suspect that politics would get dull, but I think it's getting even more interesting than it has been. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time. Thank you.